Welcome one, welcome all to the Deep Fat Fried episode about David Bowie. Let's get it, TJ. Let's get it. Let's get it, TJ. One of David Bowie's many hits. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. I don't think so, guys. You don't think so, Scotty? Don't 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 recall that one. Don't recall that, TJ. Or I'm sorry, you don't ever say TJ. You say TJ. TJ. <laughs> so one of the things we should probably mention before we even get into David Bowie too much is that we have added a ten dollar level to the uh, DFF Patreon. Thievery, madness. Thievery, madness, death. What have you taken away from me? Surely something has been taken away. You swore on the life of your own mother that there would never be another tear. Tell tell the people what's been taken away from them. Uh, Actually, uh, nothing. What? Yeah. You mean nothing's been taken away? Nothing, not a thing. We actually added something. We added uh, Discord rewards to the $5 tier. Yeah, so... So as far you, as the five dollar tier goes, the only thing we've done is now you get a Discord roll. Yay! Madness, take it but away from me. If you want to spend double the money, you can double your pleasure as well <sighs> at the chef's table. Oh, right. oh, chef's table. Why don't you tell them a little about the chef's table, there, Paul? It's a cornucopia of behind the scenes content. We're talking pictures that we take, vlogs from the road. Like some fucking food reviews when we go out to eat and shit. Um, you know, just behind the scenes stuff. A little bit extra. You know, it's a way for us to say thanks to people that want to give a little extra and support the podcast a little more without taking away from the core content, which is the buffet, which we all feast upon. Plus, Flash Fried Live. Flash Fried. Flash Fried. That's we've, right. We've typically done pre recorded. We're going to start doing it live in front of a limited. Audience, an audience limited to those at the chef's table. And after each episode of Flash Fried, so crispy. we will go into the Discord server and chat with fans so for a little bit and just see what's so on flesh. your guys' minds. Get some input directly from you. Now, obviously, in Discord rooms, there's limited space, so it's going to be first come, first serve. But you have a chance to get in there, talk to us. And who knows? We might just pop in on our own now and then to see what's going on. Yep. Uh, and you get more Discord rolls. You get better Discord rolls than the five dollar people because you are the elite. You're at the chef's table now, you fucking sons of bitches. Senor Tomat, so pairs a succulent. Five dollar patrons, we love you. Ten dollar patrons, we love you. Also, dude, my mic everybody. is not. My mic is not off, dude. <laughs> not only is it not off, I can see it picking up. Yeah, people. People are saying my mic is off. It's not. It's off. I am, I am, however, quieter than both of you by a significant margin looking at the voice meter output. Yeah, you do look a little quiet there, Paul. See? See, TJ? Trying to stifle my creativity. I think yeah. it's an, uh, Paul, Sorry at this point, that. I think it's intentional. Yep. He, he, he wants to be silenced, but well, the people will not have me silenced. You're such a goddamn mouth. I'm just trying to make you a little more tolerable. That's the people will not have I, me I, silenced. I, I noticed TJ on the sound where every time Paul starts talking, he starts turning it down more and more. It's like, ah... Get it's this, like, can't hear Paul. Can't this hear droning Paul. idiot out of my ear. No, there's not going to be a $20 level. Nope. Listen, there's not going to be a, a $20 level or a $30. There's, like, these are our two tiers. This is what we're going to do. We might add an advertiser tier in the future, or we might just do that some other way. We are going to start offering some ads on the show. Whether we do it through Patreon or not, we're not sure yet. But... As far as you guys are concerned, these are the two tiers. We couldn't possibly do another tier unless we, unless I just said, like, fuck it, I'm no longer doing the TJ Kirk channel, or fuck it, I'm no longer doing anything but just devoting <laughs> every second it, of my life to Deep Fat Fried. It's Friday. not Who like knows? anyone would care if you stopped doing the TJ Kirk I mean, we're almost it's there dead. as it is. Anyway, it is dead. 2011. Dead. TJ was the best. TJ. Also, uh, stay tuned for the 24-hour show this month. Uh, our patrons graciously unlocked that last month with yes. 3,000 patrons. So this month, thou shalt be getting 24 straight motherfucking hours. Dude, it's going to be an overload of the buffet, dude. Full bellies all around. Of deep drat fried. It's going to be delicious. Fucking delicious. Oh, you know what it's going to be. I think, is Paul joining us via Skype, dude? <clears throat> 
Paul is joining us via bad back. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, joining bad. you via a chair that I can sit in for longer than 10 minutes and not be in agony. Scotty, so. could you scoot just like a smidgen from where you are? Which way? Whichever, I don't know, whichever way is, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Boom, shakalaka. That's fucking Scotty, like- you're looking dapper tonight, man. I like the Ziggy Stardust going on, huh? I'm liking the hair, too. Everybody that's been fucking on Scotty's man bun, what do you yeah, got to say now? Don't fuck my man bun, dude. Don't do it. <laughs> that's just the awkward intermediary stage. Dude, it happens everyone. Growing they're growing their hair long. long. See, it's like... It's getting pretty decently long. Yeah. All right, TJ. I like how he like turned to look at his hair, like where? Is it no, I was, sh- I was showing it to the audience. No, nah, you you're turning that. to look at it, Scotty. Okay, yeah, that's what I was that's doing. How dumb you are. You caught me, TJ. They said they want to see me for the meme, TJ. Give them a, give them, pick up your camera and show them, show, show oh, me. Oh yeah, let's just fuck everything up. To it's not, dude, you, you can put this. it right back where it is, TJ. You can put it right back where it is. It's, see, it's Paul now, in a lawn now, chair. Now you know that I'm here. <laughs> it's Paul, uh, Paul lawn chair vision. There you go, guys. <laughs> what a great shot. <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's terrible. I look like a goddamn oh, toad. TJ's... <laughs> I look like a fucking bullfrog sitting here. Hey, guys, how you going? Welcome to Deep Fat Fry. I'm Paul Ego. <laughs> Paul, look how fat I am. I've been eating nothing but potatoes and cheese my whole life. What the fuck is wrong Paul with Paul loves me, cheese curds, you know. Nothing oh, wrong look how that. fucked up that was, TJ. Look how hard it was to get back to perfect. It's... It is. You had it fine. No, it's not fine. Hey, look at it. It's perfect right there. Your dead you know, ball center. You know, I don't like it, Paul. I really don't like it's not, it. It's not I feel working like out. You really ruined everything, right. Paul. Put the fucking image of Bowie back on. This isn't the fucking TJ and Paul fucking goof on each other's show. Is it? it? Is. is it? Oh, okay. It is, well, I, let, me, let me just retire for the fucking evening then. Where you guys <laughs> trade bars. All that prep all you did is for naught. Yeah, it's yeah, for naught. We're not even bothering with that shit. Oh, no. Uh, there's one more thing we probably should mention no, uh, before that? we get into it is. Uh, L.A. Meetup slash live show, DFF live show and meetup. It's going to be an entire evening of uh, of antics. Stru- um, we are aware at that seven and not ending until pretty much two in the morning. Still close. Uh, we are aware though right now that Ticketfly was hacked. Yes. So if you guys are trying to buy tickets, that is an issue right now. I think it's back now. It is. Is it finally back now? Yeah, it's, it's back, back now. Up. Okay, it good. Was, it was down for a little while. A bunch of people wrote me like, "Your ticket flies down. Your ticket no, all of Ticket Fly was down. Yeah, not just us. It was Ticket Fly itself. They got his act by <laughs> quote unquote cyber incident. Cyber. Oh shit, incident. dude. Not a cyber. <laughs> not, incident. Not, yeah, it's not a cyber incident. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's two t- there's two ticket levels. There's a seventy five dollar ticket, Rip which off. is the VIP, which you guys get to come in an hour early and hang out with us before the live show. The rest of you, you get to come in, see the live show, uh. and then hang out with us. But you're gonna have way more competition. So that's what's going on. It's happening at the Mint in L. A. July twenty first. Make get your, your fucking tickets. plans. If you're not coming, you're a fucking loser. Be there or be twenty one plus twenty one plus square. Yes, twenty one plus a yeah. square. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Oopsie days. There we go. <laughs> the intro again. Yeah, let's, 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 let me just one more time. Let me read this shit about David Bowie with TJ's ugly fucking face. So, if I had to pick a word for David Bowie that I hear, like as you talked about Kurt Cobain, you obviously, unfortunately, it's suicide. For Manson, it'd be the term shock jock. For David Bowie, it's chameleon. David Bowie was never content to be static. And honestly, he was never really afraid of failing because he had failed so many times in his career that he just knew that that was just... He, he understood there was going to be peaks and valleys in a, a career. That's just how it goes. Well, that's an admirable quality. Um, he was a massive inspiration to so many people. I mean, not just his fans, but artistically. I mean, if you're, you're talking about rock and roll royalty, I mean, this guy was around them. He was, you know, he was friends with Mick Jagger. He was friends with John Lennon. He were, I mean, John Lennon, you know, actually helped him co-write some of his songs that appeared on his albums. And he remained relevant for a long time, too. Friends with Trent Reznor. Yeah, they had collaborations. Um, Bing Crosby, for fuck's sake. Yeah, that's actually true. A Bing Crosby collaboration. Live Aid, uh, deeply private but provocative. And he was honestly an engine of innovation. He was uh, an artist that was never content to say, well, I did this album this way. Uh, it sold really well, so I'm just going to keep doing this. You know, he didn't fall into that kind of like Guns N' Roses hair metal trap of, I'm going to make, we're going to make this album. Well, let's make another album that sounds exactly the same. Or we're out of ideas, so let's not even make a fucking album. Like, you know, let's say Chinese Democracy. 
Um, well, pot shot at you, fucking. Uh, guns I still like Guns and Roses, roses but there. but but that that's just the uh, the honest God's truth. Knock, knock, every, on what I liked about Bowie wow, is every wow. album of his yeah, was a what? snapshot of his state of mind, the kind of the method of his madness, what was going on in his life. I mean, even if it was on a grander scale, it was still deeply personal. Still, it kind of kind of similar to Manson in that way, maybe. Well, I think Man. I mean, you know, Manson definitely took a huge page out of the. Bowie I mean, book. Bowie was the kind of the template that Manson just borrowed heavily from. I mean, even down to the the contact lenses in the eye, because David Bowie was hitting his eye when he was young. That's why he had the uh, one eye that was blue and discolored, and his. Oh, other really? Eye was, That's why Manson did that. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, also, you could see I mean, a lot of images of Manson with him wearing an eye patch, which is something Bowie did in the seventies. Um. Bowie honestly never really gave a fuck about being understood. He's never an artist that said, this was the song, I'm going to give you the meaning. And I mean, I know that's not necessarily unique, but he never really did these lengthy interviews where he would just say, well, this is exactly what I'm talking to you about. This is actually what I'm telling you. He kind of understood the personal connection and the personal experience of music. Here's a little photo of Manson and Bowie together here. Who's that uh, hot chica kissing him on the ear there? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. God damn. I think Manson said she ruined the meeting, though. Yeah, he, he said that she was yeah. a total vapid bitch and that he wished that she wasn't there when he met Bowie. I bet Bowie was happy she was there later. <laughs> <laughs> Manson's like, go away, bitch. This is my Bowie moment. <laughs> but he kind of understood his music was a very personal experience. I think he wanted it to be interpreted by when you listen to the song, however you felt about the song, if you just listen to the song. I mean, but it's funny people that just listen to music and they don't really think about it. They just like what they like and that's it. One thing that stands out to me about all the artists we covered, whether it was Manson, whether it was Bowie, whether it was Cobain, um, just each of them had a way of just putting like the entire essence of who they are into their voice when they sing. Definitely. Like, that's like the kind of singer I like. I don't give a shit about, I can hit all the right notes and I'm a good technical singer. I mean, that's beautiful and that's fine. And, you know, that's to be commended. But my favorite singers are the ones that can just throw their whole personality into their, their voice performance, you know? Well, I mean, they beca- in the case of like Manson and Bowie, you know, it's largely becoming a larger than life persona. It's, you know, someone who is like intensely private, but at the same time, able to shed that persona and adapt to what they want to be as a performer saying, I don't care. I'm fearless when I'm on a stage, but I can be intensely private, not even really want to get into my personal life or even that. That's not the focus of what they were doing. The artistic process and the product was the focus. And I mean, that shows the commitment to art. So we're kind of getting to his biography now. Um, here's a little, here's him as a little ass. Yeah. Let's uh, do that kid right here. Look at them ears. And I, and I label each. Uh, so this was like Bowie in 1955. I just want him to fly away by flapping those ears like fucking Dumbo, dude. This is young Bowie. So David Bowie was born David Robert Jones in Brixton, South London, England, on January 8th, 1947. What was our? What year was our dad born? 1946. Yes, yeah, so they were pretty close in age. Yep, born on the same time. Uh so we fast forward a little bit because obviously when you're a baby, you're not really you're not really doing too much. David Bowie, when he was three, was probably just taking a shit and playing with it, you know. <laughs> uh, so the same year, uh, and this is referring to like uh, the, the early '60s, his are interest we, in music. We, this is him as a slightly older kid, yeah, looking gangly and awkward as fuck right there, but also looking very David Bowie-ish. <laughs> yeah, you this can is where the Bowie. You can definitely see it. He hasn't quite grown into it yet. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> so basically, he, he starts getting interested in music. His father starts bringing home American 45s, which is just a format of media that was popular in the time period. <laughs> Those are like small Yeah, records. small vinyl records. Yeah, small yeah. vinyl records, yeah. Um, he was, I mean, he was interested in things like the Teenagers, the Platters, Fats Domino, who recently uh, uh, just died, I believe, uh, Elvis Presley. Uh now, the song... These are what 45s look like, yeah. in case anyone's curious. <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting. Uh, upon listening to Little Richard's song, Tutti Fruity, <laughs> Bowie would later say that he heard the, uh, the voice of God. Tutti, Tutti Fruity, Fruity, dude. Tutti Fruity. A wop, bop, a loo, bop, that's why I pulled that, that quote. Is It's probably just because of the crazy... Like He'd probably never heard something that energetic before. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, because that really... like. As in terms of like the music that was coming out then, that tempo was like crazy. I remember like they used to have this horrible practice they do back in the day. They'd have the black songwriters 
do the, the songs and then they have a untalented or not as talented anyway white singer do a cover and then put that out and push all well, remember during the, so 12, the, tw- the 12 hour show we watched and where they uh, had Tutti Frutti they couldn't even they couldn't even do it with because the, the, the white cover artists couldn't even you know keep up with the shit we watched that movie was it the Island of Zombies or some shit uh, yeah. King of the Zombies oh, King yeah. of the Zombies and they have the black character who's actually this re- a really talented actor he has good comedic timing for the you know for the time period he's, he's basically just a really good actor and they have these bland white actors who are obviously just there to make this to, to, so this guy can be in this movie right he's the star of the movie but they can't say that because people are going oh well I'm not going to see a movie with a black guy starring that, in that role uh, who did Tutti Frutti was that fucking um, Fats Domino no, that's, that's Little, Richard. Little Richard Little Richard dude. cool Little Richard dude uh, another huge inspiration was uh, Elvis Presley so here's a quote from uh, Bowie I saw a cousin of mine dance to Hound Dog and I had never seen her get up and be so and be moved so much by anything it really impressed me the power of music I started getting records immediately after that. So he really just sees the impact that music can have on people. He sees Elvis. He sees these crowds losing their minds. These girls going, ah, they're just, I mean, even in their own, the, the privacy of their own homes, they're just going crazy. They're going crazy in the streets. And I think it's just you kind of, that, that just innate appeal to have fame and to have that recognition and, and to affect people in such a profound way just kind of strikes him at such an early age. I mean, he picked two of the most flamboyant live stave, stage performers, too. I mean, Little Richard and fucking Elvis. I mean, you can really kind of see where he developed his sense of kind of over-the-top glam and shit. Yeah, I mean, he, he wanted it to be theatrical um, in a big, grandiose way that, you know, Elvis obviously was pushing those buttons. Uh, you know, Elvis, I mean, like, look, you're talking about the... There's a reason he's called the king of rock and roll. I mean, he's like an archetype for what a rock star is. Now, obviously, the the archetype has kind of drifted a little bit away from it, but you can still Not easily, as far as you think. Yeah, you can still easily trace it back. Oh, I mean, yeah. You look at the way this dude is dressed here. Uh, Elvis is dressed in this picture. I mean, not too far from the way dudes are dressing now in rock bands with the tighter pants and, you know, the loose-fitting yeah. jacket, the hips swaying and shit. I mean, he was he definitely started it all. So not long after this, Bowie's, you know, he starts learning the ukulele, the the T chess bass. I love that that's the first instrument that he learns is the ukulele. <laughs> yep. Uh, he's, he's participating in skiff lessons, uh, sessions with friends. He started to play the piano. Uh, meanwhile, he starts to kind of like emulate the, the basically the present, presentation style of both Presley and Chuck Berry, you know, gyrating, over the top, dancing. So like you said, he really did appeal to the more over the top, Attention getting things, especially for this time period. Talking about the so here, 50s. here he is with a crazy haircut. That's Bowie. That's yeah. Bowie, dude. I didn't look anything like Bowie. Did he get a nose job and shit <laughs> later in life? It looks like he did. I think it's just a weird angle on his face and a weird haircut, too. Here's Bowie and Iggy Pop. Yeah, he was, so he later, actually, we later produced some of his albums. So, um, by, by the age of 13, he started playing saxophone. And a big influence in his life, and it's even his By music. By the way, this is him at, at 12 here. I mean, he looks younger than that, but this is him at 12. A so. late bloomer. So, yeah, I mean, like a year after this, this little g- gawky white kid is playing the sax, you know? That's pretty cool. So, the uh, I mean, yeah, when you think about that, just a year later, he was starting to learn the saxophone, which is something that you hear a lot in his music. Uh, a big influence in his life was his half-brother, Terry. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, he kind of really did expose David to a lot of uh, different artists and music. But unfortunately, uh, Terry had his demons. He had uh, he suffered from mental illness. Uh, he had to be committed well, to an why institution. Why was he? Was his? Uh, was Terry like a musician as well or something? Um, he did. I, I think I, I, I didn't really research too much in him, but he really exposed. Uh, I, I, I think he did have musical uh, proclivities, but yeah. unfortunately, he was he was severely mentally ill. Uh, he was schizophrenic. And he had to be committed to an institution for most of the remainder of his life, basically. And uh, in 1985, he actually committed suicide in, in the <coughs> institution. And um, later, basically, a focal point in a song called that Billy Rowe called Jump, they say. So we then move forward to about age 16. He I'm graduates. I'm assuming that's probably around the time this was taken. 
I mean, he might be a little older than 16. Yeah, here. maybe a little bit older there. But page I mean, like, boy, Page Boy Bowie, dude. Page, what the fuck? I don't know what the fuck. His actual first there. TV appearance, uh, to kind of just move off the biography set for a second, was he was in some like long, ma- long-haired male society, and he's on the BBC, and he's talking about it's okay for ma- men to have long hair and stuff, and we, we're now different, blah, blah, blah. Wow. I'm going to see if I can find a picture of him in the long hair society. That, this, this actually is from that, I guess. Yeah, so I believe that's what it's from. from the long hair society. Huh? Yeah, he's yeah. doing like a, a head turn there. That's probably why his face is a little distorted. Right. Because he's f- flipping. Flapping it back and forth. So at 16, he graduates from Bromley Technical High School, and he starts working as a commercial artist. I mean, pretty much immediately. He's, he also can't need to play music. Oh, he actually formed the Long Hair Society. Yeah, he did. See. So that's like, he was like trying to do like a little weird civil right thing with it. Wow. Yeah, the advancements of uh, people with long hair, dude. Cool. Uh, he, you know, he hooked up with a number of bands, and he finally formed a group called Davy Jones and the Lower Third. Um, Davy Jones and the Lower Third? And the Lower Third. Oh, okay. Uh, not much critical success. They released, you know, some music during that time period, but... You know, he was very young, and I don't think, the, the for the most part, it just never gained any traction for him. Uh, so, if you guys have heard of the Monkees, right? Yep. Well, unfortunately for David Bowie, uh, the uh, member of the Monkees also was named Davy Jones. So, he was like, no, I'm not being associated with this. I'm, I, I'm not doing this. Right, yeah. I forgot, yeah, I forgot about that. That's true, yeah. And uh, around the same time, too, that would have been unfortunate. So at that time, he changed his name, to uh, his last name to Bowie, a name that was inspired by the knife developed by the 19th century uh, American pioneer Jim Bowie. Cool. Because he's going to cut you like a knife. (laughs) So we go to 1969, and Bowie's finally just going back to music full-time. I mean, like, you see, he has these projects. I mean, this looks, for the period, this is pretty generic, you know, it's this isn't this isn't really anything that's gonna sta- that's gonna jump out at you. The Manish Boys. The Manish Boys. The we Manish, the Manish boys. boys. And this is when he starts. Bully really finally gets kind of his first breakthrough. Probably the first song that most people would know him for, which is Space Oddity, which is released on Mercury Records in 1969. Here's what he looked like it, around that time. In case you want to know, this is a uh, I got a 1969 picture here. Damn it! Get up there, you son of a bitch! Get up. Yeah, so he's, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this. I mean, here's what you can say about it. Dudes all wanted to look like this in the 70s. Well, it's, maybe it's, they did. it's really like against our fucking sensibilities now. <laughs> but in the 70s, this was hot shit. In the 70s, this was hot shit. In the 60s, I guess. This <laughs> might not have been the 70s yet. <laughs> no, this is 1969. So right. basically, basically David enough. Bowie is single-handedly starting the 70s right yep. here. You know? With the flower Whoa. print butterfly C- color Kind of like shirt. Uh, Howard Bloom started the yeah, 60s. Yeah, Howard Bloom started the 60s. Then Bowie then did the David 70s. Bowie came along and started oh, the 70s. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 they're on the same, the same league for that. Same league. Um, he looks like Ellen Ripley. He kind of <laughs> does. <laughs> he kind of does, dude. I never would have made that connection. Oh. So the song Space Oddity, Odyssey, Bowie Oddity. will later say this about it. Yeah, Space Oddity. Um, so the song came to him after seeing Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. I went stoned out of my mind to see the movie, and it really freaked me out, especially the trip passage. Oh. Yeah, I mean that was pretty crazy. I mean, yeah. Well, if you, I mean, especially if you think about the time period yeah, of the '60s. Know. I mean, like the first time I saw the movie, it was like, "What the <laughs> fuck is going on?" And now the movie devolves into ten minutes of weird, the trip of the Star Child, trippy dude. shit, and then he turns into the Star Child and floats to dude, Earth. Dude, that is a fucking it's like, okay. dude. Get us a picture of Warren to all Officer Ellen Ripley, dude. <sighs> all right, all I, right, dude. You gotta, you gotta do the side by side. It's too, it's too good. I mean, but you talk about timing. Uh, so the song uh, honestly coincided with the BBC's. Uh... <laughs> it's perfect. Hold on, Scott. Sorry, Scott. Sorry. No problem. This has to be done. Yeah. Uh, hold on. I gotta make it. Dude, it really up. is pretty <laughs> spot on. This <laughs> is okay. So there. I don't know. Whoa, dude. <laughs> this is ground control to Major Ripley. The xenomorphs are here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, no, that, that, that's this is nothing to do with anything. Just a meaningless digression. Okay. No, that's yeah. that's fine. Good old that's like that's why people love the show, dude. <laughs> that's what it's all about, man. Uh, 
So the uh, the song clicked resonate with the public, sparked uh, sparked in large part by. By the, by the way, that's a good fucking song. Just to throw that out there. Yeah. Oh, oh dude, yeah, the, it is. Uh, that, was it was it that astronaut, um, the Canadian uh, Chris. What's his name? Headfield or something? Yeah, yeah. He did a cover of it, and that was a really popular thing. I mean, he did a, a cover years. in space. In space. You know? How do you top Bowie? You actually do it from the space station. You do you know? it in space, dude. That's what you do. But, I mean, obviously, you remember, if you remember this time period, that's when going to the moon was a big deal. Right. So this right. sparked in large part of the BBC's use of the single during its coverage of the Apollo 11 moon landing. So you have a perfect song for this generation, for this time, and this song just comes at the perfect time. Just and it's his first hit, and it's like, okay, now he's actually got some traction going. Because b- prior to this, he'd been putting out music, but it wasn't working out. It was like, no, it, really, it, it no wasn't really working. Um, a few years later, it actually be re-released in the U.S., and it claimed, uh, climbed to number 15 on the chart. So about three years later, this actually even came out in the U.S. to some success, but primarily a hit in Britain. Right. Like, he was, they weren't really known outside of Britain at that time. Yeah. It's so like then... Um, early for that, probably. Uh-huh. <clears throat> We kind of briefly, then that you know, we're gonna kind of discuss some of the albums more. But um, Bowie's next album, The Man Who Sold the World, that was just basically further catapulted him to stardom. Uh, like I said, but primarily in the UK, the, the record offered up a heavier sound more than anything Bowie had done, including the song "All All the, All the Madman" about his institutional brother uh, brother Terry. So I mean, as you see, this is kind of a theme in his life. Like he's always kind of having his brother in the back of his mind, who it kind of introduced him to music, but. Just he can't have a connection with him because of obviously he's institutionalized. He just he's not in his right mind. Right. <clears throat> the next thing, the next time period is really what Bowie is known for. That's Ziggy Stardust. Yeah, the Ziggy Stardust era and shit. As Bowie's celebrity profile increased, so did his desire to keep his fans and critics guessing. Uh, he made he did outrageous stunts like claiming he was gay. And, and then uh, you know you're actually rocking the the whole Ziggy Stardust fucking. Um, the iconic lightning bolt down is, the middle of the face. Well, this isn't from Ziggy, the album Ziggy Stardust. This is actually from the next album, uh, Aladdin is Sane. It, well, when I searched for David Bowie's Ziggy Stardust... It, it, no, it is Ziggy, first, it is Ziggy... This is still a Ziggy Stardust uh, persona. Oh, okay, so, but... He, okay. But it's not It's not from the album, the Ziggy Stardust album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust. This is from the, the, the next album. Cool. What do you look like with it without your glasses on? Because you can't even see the whole thing. There you go. Cool. <laughs> this guy, he rolled his eyes as he's putting his glasses back on. Let me get through this shit, TJ. I'm doing this, TJ. Fuck you. Claimed he was fucking gay, TJ. Would you have the balls to do that? You said you're bisexual. Bowie claimed to be gay. He went one step further. In the se- I mean, in the 70s, though. In the 70s. I mean, that's ballsy. That's, that's ballsy today. It's, yeah. you know, in the Especially 70s. when he wasn't even gay. Right. Like, he's not even gay, and he's like, oh, yeah. He, he has that in common with the Kurt Cobain. Yeah, remember, that's true. You You're that? right. Both of them Kurt. were identified with the whole gay subculture thing. Yeah, Kurt also did that. That's true. But David Bowie was not gay. Kurt Cobain was not gay. But uh, this is the like point. Used that as like ah, this is kind of my way where of he making really, myself an outsider because I feel he like deb- one. he debuted Ziggy Stardust, which is Bowie's imagining of a, of a doomed rock star and his backing group, the Spiders from Mars. So this has been Bowie as part of a band. See, I don't know if this picture is era appropriate, but um, you know, whatever. It's fine. Uh, so his most famous album is The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and The Spiders from Mars. This is when Bowie just broke out. This is when everyone... Fi- this is when he really became famous. He became culturally just totally relevant. People knew who he was. People were talking about him. And really outlandish. 27 studio albums from this fucker, yeah. by the way. Um, the, the, I mean, if you look at this period, dressed in wild outfits. I mean, if you... If you I mean, the androgyny... I mean, over the top, and it's really just, I think, the moment where he broke the mold. He really didn't, he wasn't really content at that time to keep making the same kind of music. I mean, even though, if, even if you see the man who sold the world, he's still just a dude playing rock music. It's just like, yeah, I'm going to do this, you know, this is cool, this is a fun, but this is when he becomes a serious theatrical performance. And once again, dude, the parallels between him and Manson, I mean, the obvious uh, Manson worship of, of Bowie is showing again, because he did the, basically the same thing in the 80s. Towards the end of the 80s, Manson comes along, breaks the mold, defies all the expectations Even the 90s. of the big hair, poofy. Yeah, and at the end of the 80s, 80s and end of the 90s, he he did the same thing. So, very cool. And a, and a high concept album, too, uh, the first Ziggy Stardust. Oh, yeah, dude. It's an extremely yeah, well, I mean, high like, concept. 
Uh, he, he pretty much did, I don't know if every album he ever did after that was a concept <laughs> album, but a lot of them were. He did a lot. He did quite a few concept albums. He was albums fond of the concept album, for sure. So Bowie's love of acting and a total immersion of the characters he created for his music, and this is another quote from Bowie. Off stage, I'm a robot. On stage, I achieve emotion. It's probably why I prefer dressing up as Ziggy to being David. With satisfaction came severe personal difficulties. You know, really the problem that ultimately ended up happening for Bowie in this time period was he wasn't really able, he felt like people knew him as Ziggy Stardust. So he felt maybe a little typecast in that. Well, he felt in a way that he needed to be that character, I think, to perform and be that. Because David Bowie was not, this was not David Bowie. This was Ziggy Stardust. He's this quiet, sort of shy dude. Yeah, th- but he has this outrageous, you know, stage Al- persona that's yeah. totally alter ego kind of thing. The opposite of how he is in in real life, you know, because he want he's this you know shy sort of quiet, unassuming dude, but he likes to go out on stage and have this like miles over the top persona of like you know I'm this weird androgynous space alien who's here to you know, sing these crazy songs that are unlike what other people are doing. I mean, another quote I pulled from about Ziggy Stardust was, wouldn't leave me alone for years. That was when it all started to go sour. My whole personality was affected. It became very dangerous. I really did have my doubts about my sanity. I mean, so... What was he talking about there? Like, just... This, but the persona of Ziggy Stardust, because... So he was starting to lose himself to it a little bit? Yeah, it was just, you know, the act became him. It was... It kind of bled through. Someone in the chat just said, like, he was, like, method acting with his own life. He know? really was. He was method acting with, with his musical performance. He just... He couldn't, at, at that point, separate himself from the character. So, I they mean, two were like... The more, crazy. You, the, more, the more you inhabit something like that, I mean... You know, if you inhabit something that's that's strange and alien, you're going to start feeling strange. So here's some things that happened during the Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Insane uh, tours. Basically, Bully would would basically strip down to a sumo wrestler loincloth, or he would even simulate oral sex on you know one of his band members' guitars. So once again, <laughs> shades of Manson later. Oh yeah, <clears throat> uh, he even toured and gave press conferences as Ziggy. Um, but that, that's, this all ended in his retirement at London's Hammer, Hammersmith uh, in Odeon on July 3rd, 1973. Uh, and yeah, actually, you can see footage of it. If you watch um, Ziggy Stardust on the, on the Spiders from Mars, he actually announces this is the final show as Ziggy Stardust when he retires the persona. Okay. I think really the thing about that that's really ballsy is that we have to think about it from the perspective of like this is what he's known for, and now it's like it's like you said he is method acting, but at that point he goes, well, I'm just going to walk away from that. I mean, most people don't walk away from their biggest success. Well, I mean, he has to. He's done two albums at that point as the Ziggy Stardust character. He's been living like the Ziggy Stardust character. He's doing press conferences as the Ziggy Stardust character. At that point, he's got to kind of ask himself, like, do I want to be Ziggy Stardust for the rest of my career? And he probably just said, no, I don't. No, I don't. You know, it's, it's time to move on. So that's that's probably what's going on there. Just like not wanting to just fall forever into that role and be, just be that thing for the rest of his fucking life. Uh, <coughs> I would say so. So the next album, the follow up to that is very similar in glam style. It's a lad insane, which is a lads, a lad insane, but it's a lad Sane. I get the. I think we yeah. get the wordplay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, it's it's hard when you say it not to say it though. Uh, so then we we, we basically go on. Um, Bowie did, wasn't exclusively just a musician. Some people know him just for his music. Uh, his love of film helped help him land the title role in the film The Man Who Felt the Earth, which came out in 1976. And uh, basically, Bowie started in a Broadway production of The Elephant Man, which he received an acclaim for his performance. Cool. Uh, you guys have sure have seen Labyrinth, where he plays Jareth the Goblin King, directed oh, yeah. by Jim Henson. Uh, George Lucas produced that film. One of my favorite movies from uh, when I was a kid, for sure. Oh, dude, I, I, I've, it still holds up to this day. I mean, his performance is one of the defining moments in the film. It's certainly not Jennifer Connelly. Oh, uh, yeah. 
Jennifer Connelly stole <laughs> the fucking show, dude. I mean, I wanted to give it to Jennifer Connelly, but well, I, I, I can't really blame you. Yeah, I think I have a Jareth the Demon King or the Goblin King fucking photo in here somewhere. You remind me of the babe. The babe with the power. I'll just fucking pull up a new one because I don't want to open 12 wrong tabs. Don't fucking I do it, TJ. Right it's all labeled for you, idiot. Power of voodoo. There we go. Different persona. Yeah, there you go. So there we go, yeah. And we're going to talk about those things a little bit more later, but... Um, yeah, um, and they're, they're, they're queued up for then, but yeah, I just wanted to show them a quick... Because, I mean, that's all... I mean, that's... That's what's going like, on. Like, when you t- when you say to me, like, okay. David Bowie as an actor... <clears throat> this is what you think. I mean, I'm thinking of this, first thing, before yeah. anything else. I would agree with that. It's not the only thing I saw him in, but it's the first thing that pops into my head is like, oh, yeah. I mean, the whole soundtrack to Labyrinth is great, too, and all yes. done by Bowie. Yeah, he's, so. he's fucking, he's phenomenal, and uh, he did a great job in that movie. You know, not only, I mean, like, I don't know, man, he was just awesome. Like, he was, like, leagues better as an actor than fucking Jennifer Connelly was in that movie. In fact, the rocks that, the, <laughs> the rock in the rocks background were better yeah. actors than Jennifer Connelly in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever. You know. I mean, but the Labyrinth's an 80s cult classic. We'll, we'll oh, it's about. awesome. I mean, like, you know, when the we, Jim Henson stuff, we'll, fucking we'll, classic we'll, we'll shit. Get, we'll get more Yeah, well, I was going to say, when we get to Labyrinth, I, I, I can impersonate almost everything in that film. That, so that's we'll, awesome. We'll have we'll, to go through it. We'll do that in a minute, then. So, you know, in the 80s, Bowie's big hit that he's, I mean, that he's known for. And by the way, people, I know if you, you like Bowie, there's just way too much Bowie shit to even cover as far as we, if we did the albums. So... But are we getting into the albums now? Oh no, but I I'm just saying very briefly. Uh so that kind of and the kind of that that period from uh, on he really doesn't it's kind of just a, a kind of a lax period. We're talking about the 80s now. I mean, he did have a big hit with Let's Dance. That probably was his biggest commercial success. But a lot of people, a lot of rock fans feel that was kind of a slide more into just the commercial element of things. It's it definitely like an, sounded a lot more like it was new at wave home in poppy. the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But it's definitely, it's still a good song. Yeah, man. man you like, can stomach that, that, that kind of music, which to, I can. I grew to up me, it holds the, t- I mean, it passes the test of time to me. I mean, it's maybe, maybe it's not as good as the stuff he did in the 70s, but, you know, I don't know. I like it. <laughs> I like it just fine, damn it. Son of a bitch. Son of a fucking bitch, dude. Yeah, son of a bitch. This is uh, him at Live Aid in fucking 1985, 1985. right here. Yeah, I think this was to benefit uh, Ethiopians. I mean, look at all these motherfuckers. Dude, li- yeah, watching footage of Live Aid and their performance is crazy. It's I mean, just There was a, a big bunch of huge stars queens. that did this, yep. you know? I mean, it just uh, the... the it was a all star benefit concert. I think it played on HBO too, live, if I remember, or pay per view live. It was pretty amazing back in the day. It's a huge event. Cool. St- we haven't had one of those in a while, man. I don't think it would work now. There's just, just not no big more. enough stars anymore to. Yeah. And if it did, it'd be like, it. here's Beyonce and yeah. shit. And like, eh. So Bowie has this. Um, this thing called the Glass Spider tour in like 1987. And it's kind of a tour that gets panned, and oh, it's yeah. it's a very big theatrical like vi- a lot of vignette pieces, huge set pieces. Kind of the scene as this as gaudy, pretentious tour. And it, this is about this is the year nineteen eighty seven. And Goey, so he went. They think he went like over the. Top let's call him Goey. Uh, but Bowie has this big wake up call. He's kind of just like, is this the music I want to make? Is this? He just kind of I think feels creatively unsatisfied. Like commercially, it's making a lot of money. I mean, not that us that tour, but he's still. But commercially, he's making a lot of money. But it seemed to kind of be this pattern with Bowie where he would make a lot of money, but he wouldn't be fulfilled as an artist. Well, here he, this is what David Bowie was looking like in 1987. So you see, like, you know, a lot of the the crazy stuff he was doing in the 70s is kind of like, you know. It's giving it's way getting, to a more flock of seagulls, kind yeah, of new wave look. It's getting muted considerably as he you know, becomes more like, I am 80s Bowie, what's up? So we're going from, so we go from solo uh, Bowie to Bowie uh, comes back with a band, and this band is called Tin Machine. Which Tin Machine was, I mean, they released two albums and they're widely panned. Uh, it was definitely a more, it was like a proto kind of grunge band. Not that one. Yeah, That's him with Reznor. Uh, where the fuck? I, don't, I guess I don't have one of Tin Machine. It was in the it. albums uh, folder. Nope. 
Yeah, it was. Nope. If you go on the album stand, there's a picture of Tin Machine. Yeah, whatever. I'm, we're not at the albums yet. I know. I'm just. I'm saying up if you wanted to pull up an image, that's what I'm that's just gonna. What it was. Uh, I'm just gonna pull up. Good a, job, TJ. Well, you didn't pull it. You don't have an image of them. Just fucking. Here we go. This is him. <laughs> what? This is crazy looking. Is this David Bowie, Bowie yodeling? He looks like fucking Bill Nye the Science Guy, dude. What the fuck is going on? I mean, <laughs> but Tin Machine was largely seen as Bowie kind of getting back to his roots of being more experimental. I mean, the, the, he was just—it was honestly just another guy in a band. That's kind of what, what people felt like Bowie really wanted in that time period with Tin Machine. It was just so he was kind of trying to like disappear back into like a band instead of being like I'm David Bowie and I'm the center of the attention and all this. I mean, but they're honestly the, the albums they released are commercial, uh, commercial flops. That, I mean, well, I mean, one of them went gold. It did, but it's not really the sales he had before were much higher. Um, in this time period, basically, he, it was another album called The Black Tie, White Noise, which Bowie describes as a wedding gift to his new wife, supermodel Iman, and also really struggled, you know, the sales were not that great. I mean, if you read most of the list that rank Bowie's albums, pretty low down on the list. Yeah, I mean, he had a pretty, uh, it seems like uh, he came back a little bit towards the end, but like there was a run of albums in uh, the... Late eight from the late eighties through the nineties that really <laughs> didn't do much. Uh, you know, I mean, he obviously he had his legendary status at that point. You know, there's no one's going to take that away. But like, there's just a whole bunch of David Bowie albums that I I don't hear anyone talk about. Maybe uh, maybe some people do. I know. I mean, I think that goes with anyone who has it that. Career. But I mean, uh, they all have pretty respectable. Uh, you know, opening. You know, billboard chart things. Uh, uh, kind of a weird thing he did was he sold bonds, which were backed by his back catalog, and he actually made a lot of money doing it. He, he made, like, sold bonds? Yeah. Explain this. Um, he basically issued bonds in 1997, and he earned $55 million from the sale of bonds. I think it was just to fund his artistic endeavors, and he actually... So if you up, bought one of the bonds, like, what did you get for it? A return when a return. his estate was worth more. I see. Yeah, yeah you got to return on your investment. Cool. All right. Uh, uh, now, if you pull up the thing, I I, I, I listed the uh, personas that yeah, Bowie had. The uh, and then we're gonna kind of get into his later life, which is the fuck is the article? There it is. <laughs> this is uh, I mean, this is not a comprehensive. No, no, no. This but, is just uh, some of his his most the characters he most inhabited here. So we have Ziggy Stardust, his most famous character, of course. Yeah. The provocative. I wonder if Gozer was gender kind of bending. based on Bowie, dude. I mean, it, it certainly looks like it from this picture. You know, I always, I think everyone looks like fucking Gozer, the, what is it, Gozerian or yep. some shit? Gozer the Gozerian. Finn Gozer White the Duke. That's, that's this look. We kind of saw that a moment ago. This is, um... Uh, Four years after the Ziggy, Ziggy Stardust, Bowie had ditched the extravagant hair, makeup, and jumpsuits in favor of a far more restrained white shirt, black waistcoat, blonde, slick back hair. The character was the Thin White Duke, a moniker still used as a nickname for Bowie to this day. Uh, this is when he had uh, Fame as one of his big hits, which is, I guess, co-written by John Lennon. So yeah, I mean, like definitely, you know, he's like, okay, I went here, now I got very a colorful. Now I'm, now I'm, now I'm gonna go and like, back and go, go kind to this of like place. it's at the time period that Bowie was kind of like uh, on a diet of like uh, cocaine and milk and peppers. Cocaine, milk, and peppers. That sounds that sounds pretty yeah. healthy, honestly. Yeah, I mean, he was. He, I mean, you guys, I get him. He was thin. Yeah, you know, he got thin. I mean, he was. I mean, he he's had always to be. been he's thin, Bowie, you know? man. Yeah, there's no fat David Bowie pictures. Yeah, Bowie can't win uh, in the fat contest. Yeah, major. I don't know if Major Tom was necessarily like a fleshed out character, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah, here's that that cover in space, which we probably would not want to play. If, it's 27 million. It's been had uh, watched 27 million times on YouTube though. Um, Aladdin Sane. That's kind of what Scotty's got going on because that's the cover. Of that album is uh, the the lightning bolt thing. I mean, <laughs> you, Scotty the, pulls it off just as. Oh well. yeah, dude! Of course, looks just as just as fucking Let's, iconic on Scotty, uh, dude. For sure, for sure, um, for sure. Yeah, they say it's a different persona, but I mean, everyone watch considers it to be Ziggy Stardust 2.0. Jareth the Goblin King. 
Dance magic dance. As well as recording a staggering, he actually has recorded more than twenty five studio albums. He's recorded twenty six. Well, some are like greatest hits and other things. No, these are those are just studio albums. Oh, okay, yeah. He's done according to this. Actually, sorry, twenty seven studio albums, ten live albums, fifty one compilation albums, thirteen video albums. 72 music videos, 8 EPs, 128 singles, 4 soundtrack albums, 68 other albums, and 14 other video albums. So, you know, quite quite the large <laughs> career there. You know? I mean, it spanned five decades. Yeah. You know, so, mean, you know, it started I mean, in the 70s, didn't end until the, you know, like... Started in the 60s. Black, yeah, it started in the 60s, didn't end until... Um, 2016. 2016 with the release of his final album, which debuted at number one pretty much in every major music market. Um, <clears throat> Black Star, which I'm sure we'll talk about that later. So, in 2004... Bowie basically suffered a heart attack while on stage. Well, on, while on stage, right? While on stage performing. Yeah, here's kind of him in his later years. This is not 2004, obviously. This is like more closer to his death. Let me pull up a picture of him in 2004. Uh, he made a, he, I mean, obviously he made a full recovery. He uh, wanted to work with bands such as Arcade Fire. He actually worked with Scarlett Johansson on her album Anywhere I Lay My Head, a collection of Tom Waits covers. Yeah, uh, that's that's. I've never listened to that. I've always thought that's weird, but whatever. Of course, Bowie was inducted in 1996 into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A 2006 recipient. So of here the, he is in 2004, the, around the time he had his heart attack. Yeah. Uh, did he he stopped uh, doing live shows at that point, didn't he? Um, 2006, a charity show was his last uh, live performance. So yeah, right, roughly around this time, this was kind of the end of so Bowie's So even though his, his recording career spans to 2016, his live career... It was about ten ends years earlier. About a decade. It ends a decade before yeah. that. So he didn't tour. Like no, nothing he put out uh, after two thousand six had any sort of. Well, he, he didn't really do much like at, that. at that point. His next album, yeah, uh, comes out in twenty in twenty thirteen, which is the next day, which premiered at number two on the Billboard charts. Yeah, and there's no, there's no, uh, there was no tour or anything in support of that. It's just here's an album. Buy it. I mean, yeah, considering the Bowie got start, his start in the 60s to premiere at number two. It, it was just because his health wasn't wasn't good enough to do it at that time? I think it was probably partially that. And I mean, I mean, look, I mean, at that point in his life, he was in his, you know, late 50s, early 60s. I mean, here's a picture of him late, late in his life. I don't know if this is uh, the year he died or a little before. I think it's a little bit before. But, uh, you know, you, you see, you can clearly see that, like, you know, beyond just the aging, he doesn't look that great. You know, he looks no. he looks ill. And he was. Like, he had, at this point, cancer, right? Um, if it's 2015, then, yeah. I think this is... Let me just pull up a picture of him from... Uh, I'll just pull up a 2015 picture just to make absolutely sure I'm getting I'm getting that. I mean, he actually looks a little better here. Well, he's got... He's all made up there. Yeah, this picture is from... Uh, this picture is from 2015. Yeah. So it's like a candid out and about shot. There's pictures of him looking better, but they're all part of like music videos and shit where he's obviously been made up to look better. I mean, here he just kind of looks like you're like a... a like an Orville Redenbacher kind of thing going on, you know? It looks like a political science professor. Yeah, I mean, he just, you know, he's got like a, it's like your old liberal professor granddad or something, you know? So the following year, and this is by 2014, uh, Billy released The Greatest Hits, Nothing Has Changed. Uh, the new song it featured was Sue, or A Season in Crime. Also in 2015, he collaborated on Lazarus, an off-Broadway uh, rock musical starring Michael C. Hall, Dexter, if you've seen the show Dexter. Cool. Which he revisited his character from The Man Who Fell to the Earth. So, Bowie's last album, like TJ talked about, Black Star, was released on January 8th, 2016, just two days before his death, uh, 69th birthday. New York Times critic uh, John Parlay- Parlese noted it was a strange, daring, and ultimately rewarding work with a, darken- with a mood darkened by bitter awareness of mortality. So he's making, like, it's basically his, like, I'm dying album. Right. Like, he knows he's dead. And it clearly was. And he's just like, yeah, I mean, he died 
two, two days, days after. after it came out. So I mean, and and he was keenly aware of the fact that he was dying as he was making. Oh it yeah, stuff. I mean his so, cancer. Like, I mean, there, there, he he had what happened with a lot of people during his illness. You know, he had to think, oh, I'm better, I'm getting better, I'm I'm, I'm not, you know I'm not going to be too. Well, let's just know. take a little quick run. Obviously, we can't cover all of his albums here. Yeah. But uh, is it? It's time right now for like a little run through of the of the albums, the the key albums, right? Or yep. no? Yeah, yeah, it is time. It is time for that. So I mean, like, um, this is uh, the cover of um, Space Oddity, right here, which is his 1969 kind of like breakout album that we talked about uh, a little earlier in the show. Correct. As this is like his big breakout moment. This, of course, has the fucking... The title track is Space Oddity, which is this big hit song. And, it's, you know, I think that's a song, like... There's tons of times when I've just, you know, been um, sitting around at home or something, and I'm just like, you know, this is ground control to major time. And then you gotta I mean, go listen to it and shit. And it's still a fucking a timeless good sound. song. It's a timeless song. I mean, it feels like a folk song. It has like it has all the right elements. It, it like it came in the perfect time period. I mean, Bowie's largely inspired a folk song for the space age. Yeah, that's really what it, that's really what I see it as. And it's a song that really just. I mean, what well, Ziggy Stardust made him famous. This is a song that made people realize that David Bowie was someone to listen to. So this is like, yeah, I mean, this is like his first big break because, like, prior to this, he was D- Davy Jones and the Manly Boys, yeah, the Manish Boys, Man or whatever the fuck it was, you know. Uh, pretty trippy album cover, you know. He's got going on there. I guess it's, you know, this is like acid soaked 1969 and shit. So it's not that weird so, to have a trippy uh, album cover. Something to note too is that. Every album, every album he released featured him on the cover, except Black Star. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. That's that also is another thing that reminds me of of Manson because he always wanted his face on there, always wants the Manson <coughs> face on every album cover. Um, of course, Ziggy Stardust, not the immediate follow up, but the thing that. This is just, you know, taking him to that next level of fame, bringing him into a higher level of the cultural <clears throat> awareness. Yeah, you know, a high concept album. Uh, basically, the story behind the album is that the world has five years left. There's no hope. Then you have an alien rock star named Ziggy Stardust who enters the body of a man and offers salvation in our dying days, dude. So, bas- so the world's going to end in five years. Things are hopeless. Ziggy Stardust, the fucking alien, shows up to... Yep. Save mankind somehow. Is uh, is there life on Mars off of this album as well? Or um, is that a, I th- a later album? I think that's on... Let me just see. Life on Mars, Bowie. Life on Mars is from... Yeah, I believe it's on... Um, Hunky Dory. Hunky Dory, okay. It's from that 1971. That was played by Elon Musk as he launched his Tesla into space. Cool. On the new rocket, that's the song that he played when his Tesla was a good was choice. Released. There's so many, it's hard to know, dude, to be honest with He's you. He's like, don't do ground control to Major Tom, because that's about there being problems, you know? Yeah. This is ground control to well, Major a, a lot, a lot of people consider this to be the high point of the glam movement, is this is the, the seminal magnum opus of glam. Magnum opus of glam rock. I mean, look, Bowie had... Which is weird. You know, the weird thing about that is, like, this cover doesn't really look like that much of a glam rock cover because he's just kind of in this uh, dirty street, you know, with uh, with boxes and trash and cars and rain and, you know, dark skies I mean, a, there's shit. a very grittiness to it, you know? It's just like, it's kind of like the, you know, the, the origins of rock and roll. You know itself. I mean, I, th- I think I think it honestly felt like it was taking rock into a, it, it was innovating rock. You know what I mean? It was going from the '60s, like whoa, we're gonna do acid. You know, like the Doors and this kind of psychedelic trippy thing. The Doors were another inspiration of his as well. Too. Oh, for sure. Just it, it, it takes it to a different level, dude. And pe- pe- it was a song. It was an album that you know the basically the parents hated, the youth loved, that, that, that whole ordeal. Look, it was honestly. It was this queer. It's not as it was not his best selling or his most really critically acclaimed album, but it's his most famous. It's the one that people remember him for, 
And you really can't talk about David Bowie without talking about this album. Yeah. This boy here looks like a Jack Rowland dandy, he does. <laughs> With his Jack cuffs Rowland rolled up. Dandy. And his square haircut. Where and you... his effeminate slinging of that guitar around his shoulder. What a Jack Rowling dandy <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Why does the character saying that sound like a Jack Rowling dandy? He does sound like a Jack Rowling. Shut Ro- your mouth, ruffian. <laughs> This is a Aladdin Sane cover right here. So this is basically recorded while super iconic lightning yeah. bolt makeup. This is basically recorded while Bully, Bo, uh, I can't, Bully, Bully. Well, I've said the Bowie so many. Of yeah, all time. I've said Bowie so many times. It's just running together. Bowie, Bowie, Bowie. And the spiders were chewing their ass off in an attempt to get America to love them the way England already did. So, so he was trying to break into the American. This was like this really point. him. Is like it's like he's really trying hard. I mean, and this happened a lot of times. People, you know, get success in one country, especially the UK, and now they want success in America. So obviously, it's a way bigger market. He, Bowie had a fascination with American culture. I mean, he died in Manhattan. He lived in New York for a large portion of his life. So he definitely had a fascination with our country. So he was kind of like, fuck England. Basically, the America. album is self-described by Bowie, and he doesn't really talk too much about his albums. If you really look into it, I mean, he does in a very general, nebulous way, but he describes it as... Ziggy goes to America. Um, this is really the lo- this is the last album he made with the Spiders before he disbanded uh, that band and just kind of went solo. This is lo- obviously the last album he did as Ziggy, and uh, I really think it's kind of described by a lot of people as like a street album. It's like it's very raw. It's a lot of the songs reflect just street culture and Bowie just really try- trying to make a connection with the American fan base. Yeah, yeah, love me, America. I'm David Bowie. The next album we're going to cover is uh, Young Americans. So more America fucking... He's obsessed. Look at him there. He's got a smoke. And he's got the Trump hairdo, too. Look at that. Yeah. He's Before rocking the Trump. Trump stole his haircut from fucking Young Who Americans. Who hasn't ripped off David Bowie? Am I wrong? Is that not the fucking Trump? Yeah, and Tilda Swinton stole his face, too. So, you know. What the fuck, the dude? Fuck? Dude, he looks... This is probably the most androgynous picture we have of him um, on, on, on this show, anyway. But, uh, yeah, you're right. He's rocking the Trump, dude. Yeah. The kinda, fuck? Kind of looks like Jamie Lee Curtis or something. Yeah, I know. <laughs> dude, Paul just sees, di- just sees different celebrities in Bowie. I well, do. The, look, I mean, you They're said... They're all ripping him off, You man. said he was a fucking chameleon. I mean, He is a chameleon. You can see just from the pictures we've shown here, yeah, so, he is a fucking chameleon. I, I mean... Trump ripped him off. It would have been really really easy for Bowie someone who already achieved success to just put out hey let's just make the same album let's make it over and over again he's not content to do that no he's really not he knew he had to move into a different area and this album really is more of an R&B style into it uh, he had people a uh, young soul singer named Luther Vandross did background vocals on this album cool uh, the song Fame is co-written by John Lennon um, and, the, and the result you get is Young Americans you know, some fans were kind of like, ah, oh, this isn't really what we expected from Bowie. And it's kind of like you see with, you know, like, say, say Manson or other bands that radically reinvent themselves every album. It's not always going to please the old fan base, but it's wants to introduce himself to a new fan base. He wants to keep it fresh. He wants to keep they don't want to be evolving and changing. And, uh, you know, doing the same shit over and over again. <clears throat> and the big song, obviously, from this one is Fame, which is one of my favorite songs of uh, Bowie's. Uh, the next album we have is Low, which is in 1977. That ain't it. That's him. That's him with, with Iggy, Iggy Pop. Pop. So let's see. Who, who could definitely be Deep Fat Fried himself. There we go. This is one of the... Look, I mean, I'll be honest. Like, <laughs> As far as David Bowie and his albums are concerned, I've listened to Ziggy Stardust from beginning to end, and I've listened from Low from it to end to end. Probably two, it was so those are the albums. Those are the two... I mean, I've heard all kinds of songs from all over his career, but the two albums I've actually listened to... You know, uh, the whole album, Ziggy Stardust, and this one here, Low. Low is a, a fucking, I mean, it makes you feel low, dude. It's it's a fucking bleak album. It's a very melancholic fucking sound. It's a very experimental um, album for Bowie, too. Like, like I said, I mean, he it, it doesn't sound anything like Young Americans. So in 1975, you have Young Americans, and this is basically the follow-up to Young Americans. You have I mean, Lowe. at this point, a David Bowie fan has to know to expect the unexpected. What year though. did Lowe come out in? Uh, Lowe 77. was 77. 77. Same year as Dude, Star so look Wars. look how ahead of it, like, 
David Bowie is a fashion plate is something we should probably discuss too because yeah that's something oh, yeah. we don't we definitely if you, discuss if you look at the dude here on this like the shit he's wearing looks like something out of the matrix or something that big open turtleneck with the hoodie and shit like who was wearing anything like that but bowie at the time you know what i mean well that's why bowie's always viewed as a fashion icon even um if you see the movie zoolander then they have their right. little walk-off thing bowie's the judge he's the judge of course yeah because i mean he was known for i mean his fashion sense his fashion pioneering and he, I mean, and he did that throughout his whole life. I Sometimes mean, Sometimes pioneering styles that didn't even come into m- more into the fucking mainstream zeitgeist until like decades later. So Bowie did something called the this is what it's called the first album of the Berlin trilogy, which is three albums that uh, Bowie recorded in Berlin. Uh, it's why this is one of his most influential and his first collaboration between uh, Bowie and Brian Eno. Um, really, the album is. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of a cocaine album. What this one? I mean, yeah, this is really Bowie. It this does album, not, I'll be honest with you. It does, when you listen to it, it does not sound next, like a. Well, cocaine the reason. Album. Well, the reason it's called Low is because Bowie's actually trying to kid off cocaine. Well, oh, the, okay. Oh. So this is like his trying to quit cocaine. Yeah, album. because really, okay. he, that he, makes more at, sense. At the time period, he'd been living in L.A., which uh, was basically coke, the coke mecca, coke and he moves mecca. to the heroin, you know, basically epicenter of the world, Berlin. Uh, luckily, Bowie was not into heroin, so <laughs> he didn't just trade one poison for the other. Cool. Um, it's a relatively straightforward album. The, art, the artwork for Lowe shows uh, Bowie in profile against the background of orange clouds. Not all exciting, but in the grad scheme of his album artwork, there had to be a few standard issue album covers, too. So this is kind of considered one of his um, less exciting album covers, but still interesting. I don't know. I really like the album cover personally. I actually really like it too. I mean, it honestly kind of gives me a, a, almost a Nine Inch Nails vibe of to come. Uh, That's yeah, what I'm saying. I mean, as looks, early as it was, it looks he's dressing like, like... Yeah, he looks like a fucking goth or something. Yeah, you know? like, in, like that industrial look that was popularized in the 90s and he's already doing it here. You in know? 77, you know? In the age of fucking... Luke Skywalker and shit, you know, he's, he's, he's rocking this and his hairdo too. Like people, that, that's a cool hairstyle now, but you know, he was doing it back when oh, everybody had afros. But, but he was so ahead of his time. I mean, and, and feathered fucking hair. I mean, and and shit. The, you know, he, he was big and uh, I said, he was the first major artist set up like a, an online message board, which he would actually occasionally post under the, um, uh, username sailor. He would comment sometimes on people's posts and stuff. And you can actually go find them on the internet if you're interested in that. And he did have, he was very uh, engaged with his fan base, I would say. I mean, even that way, like, even if he may not necessarily talk to them directly, he was really cognizant of what was going on and what his fans thought. I mean, even though he was very personally private, he still really wanted his fans to have an outlet and to, and to you know, give him feedback in the one way or the other and it actually connect the fans together. Which is something in the 90s, we know, like, message boards were just kind of starting out at that time period. So an early <laughs> adopter. That's cool. Of technology. Yeah, I mean, and and look, downloads. Look, uh, some of the people in the chat that are just like, ah, they skip this album and this album and this album. Yeah, I, look, there's 27 fucking albums. Guys, okay? there's, like, there's no way. We had no to way. boil it down to some essentials. I'm sorry. I mean, and there's the albums Diamond I felt. Dogs fans. and Station uh, to station. There's a lot of great albums that Bowie did, and I would like to talk about each and every one of them, but that could be an episode by itself. Hey, wait a minute. That's true. I wonder if that is. Uh, uh, that's Yeah, that's got it. That's not a coincidence. What? What's that? Yeah, I mean, that is kind of similar right there. <laughs> yeah, Manson with the big collar. Trying to... I think he's trying to fucking kind of uh, do a similar cover. Oh, there. dude, you can yeah, look at so much... in the other direction. Putting so, the Manson twist on the David Bowie. <sighs> I know for a fact that this is Marilyn Manson's favorite David Bowie album. Uh, I've, I saw him talk about it in a magazine interview, how, like, this is, like, to him, the best Bowie album. Uh, which is actually why I ended up listening to it. And I was kind of like, I don't get it, but maybe I'll try again later Dude, in life. you know what that jacket looks like that he's wearing now that I think about it? It looks like something that Rammstein would wear, dude. Rammstein! It's so cool. How do you be so cool? Why do you get to be so cool, David Bowie? I think you're special. So this is 1983's Let's Dance. Let's Dance. Um, a lot of people consider this his kind of descent into commercial uh, mediocrity. You know, it's really a very poppy sounding album. The uh, single, obviously, by the, is the same as the album title, Let's Dance. 
Uh, it's kind of an interesting music video, I felt. Um, Bill was always a very cognizant as a visual artist. He was ahead of his time, actually, with a lot of the, his music videos, like Space Oddity. If you can go back, there's actually a video for it, and this is in the 60s. This is before MTV was around. I mean, this is by this time MTV is around, and you really need to do this as a means of promoting your album. And this is actually Bowie's, I believe his greatest commercial success was this album. Even though it's kind of in the uh, considered to be a departure and not, not that great. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's a very new wave, kind of like poppy album. Um, there's actually some really good uh, uh, songs on it, though. Uh, China Girl, a lot of people love that one. Yeah, uh, I, I like that song. <clears throat> Bowie definitely shows his love for the sax, which, I mean, obviously we talked about when he was 13 is when he took up the saxophone. That, that We can't play that China Girl, girl song anymore, though, because it's... Oh, it's offensive. Because it's got the... You know, yeah. you, can't, you can't do that shit no more. Racist, uh, racist, he also racist, actually had uh, a, a blues influence. Stevie Ray Vaughan, one of the best guitarists ever, uh, actually performed on the album, and Bowie's vocals just were very high. It's, it's I mean, it's an album... I don't necessarily agree that it's a total descent into mediocrity, but I can definitely see people who f- just feel Bowie at that time has just gone totally mainstream. Well, they just mainstream. feel like it's too mainstream for a guy who was so revolutionary throughout his career. It seems like instead of setting the trend, he's following it. Yeah, this point. is probably the first time people feel Bo- Bowie is more of just a trend follower than a setter. So now, TJ, we're going to move on to Tin Machine. Under Tin the, Machine! Under the God... So let's talk about oh God. Blow that shit up a little bit. Blow it see, up. I can't see this. I'll blow, blow it up for you. Blow, blow it up, dude. You know. You know what this? Oh, look at dude. Tommy Wiseau was in Tin Machine. You might yeah. not have known that. Holy fuck, dude! Why didn't you guys tell me Tommy Wiseau was in this? That's crazy. Yeah. One of the big things about this is Bowie had a beard. People really were shocked by that. Like I've read so many quotes about people that went to see Tin Machine back in the day, which is the early '90s or the late '80s. Excuse me. And we're just like, is that David Bowie? Does David Bowie actually have a fucking beard? Who is this fucking guy? Who is it? They look like the Reservoir Dogs here. Once again, probably a, uh, like inspiring fashion. Well, this is kind of Bowie's escape from pop stardom. Like, he basically was tired of being the top 40. And here's, here's even a quote from Being shoved in the top 40 scene was an unusual experience, Bowie admitted. During an interview with the Orlando Sentinel at the time. It was great. I'd become accessible to a huge audience, but not terribly fulfilling. So the tour was financially in the black, but reviews for critics were harsh. And this is basically talking about the Glass Spider tour that we talked about before. So Bowie basically just doesn't really feel fulfilled at this time period, like, you know, leading up to this. And this is what kind of happens. We have this kind of said this proto grunge kind of escape. Like Bowie basically said, I'm really famous now and I'm really successful and I'm really making a lot of money, but I'm really not happy with this. I'm not fulfilled. So he, he kind of goes back into more of an ensemble, and the result is Tin, uh, tin Machine. Which didn't really work. I yeah, guess. he wasn't, well, it, it mean, worked. If you, if you it, wanted to get worked, out of the top 40. It worked I mean, to reignite <laughs> the spark of creativity with Bowie. Right. I mean, look, at this point, he, he kind of felt like caught between, like, he's, like I can look, I can just go tour on my hits, basically. I can go, hey, remember all those albums I did that you really enjoyed, you really liked, you really liked Low. You really like Ziggy Stardust. You really liked Hunky Dory. You like stage, all these. Out. I mean, Bowie had a ton of hits. He had so many fucking hits. You could just turn to it and say, "Look, I can just tour on this shit." You know what I mean? He didn't fucking need that. He didn't need to uh, to actually keep trailblazing. He didn't need to keep that, that. He really had no reason financially to keep pushing. Um, a bit, so but basically, it's, it's really a reinvention of Bowie. I mean, the albums didn't do well. Like I said, they were flops. I mean, I think one sold 200000 when he'd been selling millions. You know, and it really was because... But no one was interested. I mean, but look, if you, if you even look at the album cover, Bowie is kind of just off to the side. He's trying to take a lesser role. He doesn't want to be the focal point. So he wants to be part of an ensemble. Cool. But it really did... You know, there's another quote from... I look back on the Tim Machine years with great fondness. They charge me up, and I can't tell you how much... So it kind of was really, a, 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 it sparked an enlightenment, like kind of a renaissance, this big spark in Bowie's life to try to, hey, I'm going to go back and really just try to... Some people say that Tin Machine's uh, sound was a couple years too early. Like they're saying, they're, they're, they're framing it like... It kind of really he, was. He was, uh, he, he was maybe a little bit too ahead of his time with it. I mean, that seems to be kind of David Bowie's M.O. He's always like a decade or so ahead of the game. 
I want to go know, listen to Tin Machine now. Yeah. <laughs> making music that people don't know quite how to feel about until 10 years later. And they're like, oh, fuck, that was brilliant. Oh, wait, that was really good, actually. Cool. You must be kidding, David, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, you see, uh, it was Tommy Wiseau, Ethan Hawke, David Bowie, and... Uh, Who's that fourth guy? I don't know. John Travolta, maybe. If you bet Affleck. Looks like Patrick Swayze with yeah, a Yeah, oh, Patrick Swayze. That's, Patrick that's Swayze. Better. That is his. It, that's, that's who was in Tin Machine, based on this picture. So, the last album, the last album we're actually going to cover, well, we're actually going to do that uh, a little bit later. Oh. Because that's kind of the thing where we well, kind of... What are we covering? Because that's the only uh, that's that's, We're actually going to cover his film and TV now. Oh, okay. So, you want to do Black Star last. Yeah, Black Star is the... Is all the, right. So, TV work then. Paul, you claim you can do the voices of all these people. Do it. Do it. Give us your like. Dead I, on, I can do. I can do. Uh, do your dead on Jennifer Connelly now. Okay, I can't do Jim, Jennifer Connelly. But you know the big hairy thing, well, Ludo. What's the, you earlier you were bragging like I can do the voice of every yeah, character. Let's hear your Jennifer almost Connelly. Pitch I can't perfect. Do a girl. Let's hear your Jennifer Connelly, Paul. I don't have a good Jennifer. Jennifer Connelly, Connelly okay, voice. Yeah, I, I, we want to hear that one at least first. But I know. But I know. I want to hear your attempt at a Jennifer Connelly before you're allowed to do any other impression. Paul. All right. Uh... If it's all the same to you, I'd like my baby brother back. Is that Terrible. pretty good? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Is that pretty good? That was well, wretched. Well, let's hear the other characters. How about that? Okay, so the big hairy dude, Ludo. Ludo like the big, right. yeah. He's a... Ludo. Oh, hold, on, hold on, it's been a while since I've done Ludo. Ludo and Sarah friends. <laughs> Pretty spot on. Mm. I give that impression a. And then when he 6. when he's when he's getting poked by the goblins, he's like, ah, 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 ow, <laughs> ah. okay. And then there's the little uh, dog knight, Sir Didymus. Yes. Yeah. None shall pass without my permission. <laughs> That's pretty good. Come on. That's pretty good, Sir Didymus. It's not as good as the Ludo. But None that, shall pass. It's close. It's close. Ah. Um. And then and then David himself like. I don't know. Like I did I did it in one of my reviews where where I did dance magic dance, but one of the other ones like, you know, what what are the other songs in that? It's such a sad love. <laughs> Deep in your eyes a kind of pale jewel. Open and close within your eyes. Right, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not bad. Pretty Come fun. on, dude, it's not bad. What about, uh, can you do a uh, 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 Hoggle, dude? Hoggle? Hoggle don't need no friends. Hoggle don't need nobody. It's pretty close. Not bad, huh? It's not bad. How it's about the little bad. worm? Yeah. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just a worm. <laughs> That's right. Go left or right. It don't matter. <laughs> you know? Come on, come on. <laughs> what about the uh, fucking, what are the dudes that trade heads? Oh, yeah, yeah. What are those guys called? I don't even remember. Fuck. The, 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 oh fuck, boogie down with the, I don't know, the chili downs, I think they're called or some shit. Anyway, whatever. It doesn't matter. So yeah, the, uh, like we said earlier, Bowie really stole this movie. Um, if, you ha- if you haven't seen, I mean, Jim Henson's puppet work and it is great. Uh, Lucas produced it. Uh, and if that adds anything to it, I don't really think it does. Uh, Bowie is basically the star of this Everything else around it. I mean, like he's not in. He's maybe in fifteen minutes of the movie. I would say something like that. Yeah, First time I saw this movie, I thought Jennifer Connelly was just another one of the fucking puppets. <laughs> you thought she was one of the goblins? <laughs> Come on, dude. Jareth, the goblin. She's pretty cute. In this. I mean, I'm not. I'm not insulting her appearance. I'm insulting the 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 acting the range, flat range of her acting. But and it's a, the, such stark contrast. That's an insult to, to the puppets. They all did much better jobs. The, the, the puppets and Bowie are what is interesting in this film. Dude, it's hard to even like. The part of the movie before she gets to the labyrinth is honestly kind of difficult to watch because she's so fucking bad. She's a charisma vacuum. But when you get all, when you, when you get all the other interesting characters, it's fine. Smell but. bad. I love that part where they go to the bog of eternal stench, dude. Yes. Yeah, I do. Love I think that's what TJ fell into. Yeah. Yeah, dude. What? He, he clearly I think did. you slipped and fell into the bog of eternal stench, TJ. I like how it just farts endlessly. <laughs> Not that it really uh, has anything to do with David. Uh, another one we're going to look at is Twin Peaks. Pin which, Tweaks. It's a show I know Paul said he, is, he oh, loves. You watch this I shit. love Twin Peaks, man. What I love David, David Lynch. Fire David Walk Bowie with me. Like yeah, so. da- I mean, it's hard to describe anything in, in Fire Walk with me without just watching it. But David Bowie is great in it. Um, I don't know, man. I, I just, I love Twin Peaks. I loved Bowie's uh, uh, role in, in Fire Walk with me. Uh, he's kind of a, a like a shady uh, character in it, but 
I don't know. I, it's been a while since I've seen Firewalk with me, honestly. But I, re- I really remember Love and Bowie in it. Uh, why does this picture keep... <laughs> this picture just wants When are we going to talk about Ziggy, dude? Whatever. Or uh, uh, fucking Iggy, Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop, yeah, yeah. Um, Bowie actually produced one of his albums. This or multiple is, ones, I believe. Uh, David Bowie as Nikola Tesla in The Prestige. And uh, which I really like that movie. And, it's a great uh, movie. Directed by Chris Nolan. He doesn't have a huge role in it, but he he's really kind of like uh, another time when whenever he's on the screen, he just steals the show. Yeah. Um, I mean, like just really awesome Nikola Tesla performance. Kind of a, a mythologized Nikola Tesla because I remember him kind of living in like a big cavernous house, which Nikola Tesla never really was rich. Um, Somebody said Paul fucking Jennifer Connolly was fifteen, and I was six at the time. So fuck you. <laughs> I, Jennifer Connolly was sixteen, Paul. You fucking pedo piece of shit. Fuck you, Paul. Uh, Chris Nolan actually said he couldn't imagine anyone else in the role of Nikola Tesla for the movie. Why not? <laughs> I mean, someone else could have done it. I don't know. But I just think that Bowie just David nailed Bowie definitely the fu- did a fucking. I mean, for a supporting job. actor role, I mean, it, which is a very small part of the movie. It's it's actually very. He's actually the character is actually very instrumental in the story. Yeah, if you is. haven't seen the Prestige, but I mean, Bowie. Like, I remember seeing the film when it came out in 2006. I was just like, wow. I mean, Bowie just was. I was like, he just. There's a line in there, and I'll butcher it, but I'm gonna fucking paraphrase it. Where he's he's playing Nikola Tesla in this movie. And he's, he basically says, you know, if you change the world once, people will fucking hail you as a visionary. If you try to change it twice, they're going to fucking treat you like you're a madman. And I kind of felt like, you know, th- that wasn't Nikola Tesla necessarily saying that. I think that was kind of David Bowie saying that. Uh, you know, that's that line really resonated with me is like that applies to both the character and the actor playing it. Because, you know, he was so ahead of his time across the decades in a way that I don't, I, I mean, I can't think of anyone else who fucking pulled that, that feat off. It, who else do you way. think could play Tesla? Do you, can, can you envision anybody else as Tesla? Um, you know, I mean, it's Jeff like, Goldblum, maybe? T- <laughs> 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 oh, God, you know no. You know uh, uh, I'm trying to, uh, you, you see, harness see uh, electricity. I and, see a and, fucking uh, Jeff Goldblum Tesla, dude. If he played it like he played, uh, I have a atomic death ray. He played the dude in the fly, you know, uh, Brundle or whatever the fuck. Yeah, you know. You see what 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 happens is you pull the electrons out out, out of the air and, and and into the coil in, into the coil. You see, a coil. I couldn't handle it. I couldn't deal with. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, you can't you, you can't hang with. Uh, I can't hang with. I can't hang with Goldblum Tesla. Goldblum Tesla. Well, that was your suggestion, but I could honestly see it. Whatever you Whatever. psychically implanted that suggestion in my head, Real. you fucking asshole. You're always wanting Goldblum. More Goldblum. I mean, Tesla himself is someone that could definitely be Gary Oldman. Yeah, that's oh. that's good. Yeah, Gary Oldman. Gary could Oldman it. could definitely do it. I don't think <laughs> Paul I, I, could pull I, it off if Tesla sounded like Yoda. <laughs> Fuck you. All my impressions are not Yoda, dude. <laughs> Dwayne the Rock Johnson. That's uh, another. Yeah, 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 for sure. Jack Black, dude. How about him? <laughs> Jack Black, <laughs> Tesla. I'd love it. I'd watch it. It would be I terrible, think, but, but I'd watch it. But we just had a really deep understanding of, of the, at least the mythologized Tesla. I mean, like you said, they're, they're kind of relatable in a lot of ways. And Nolan saw that. I mean, Chris Nolan's a pretty good director, so... I think he, this is a great casting choice. I think what Nolan might have meant is just like he saw them both as like visionaries, obviously in different ways, different, you know, different periods and shit. But, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that works. So now we're going to talk about Black Star, which is going back to the albums now. Well, I felt this was probably the best way to kind of end because this is really Bowie. This is his. This is farewell, right? This is like his eulogy to himself, kind of sort of thing. I mean, this is like his parting gift to his fan base. <clears throat> Bowie's final final musical effort and his final gift to his fans. Uh, Bowie never revealed his illness publicly. He was ever the consummate artist, and even his death was meant to further his art. Released just two days before his death, the music videos he created and lyrics take on a haunting quality of a man. Who knows his time on earth is coming to a close. Bowie's not content to leave the world with tedious explanations or let people remember him as a gaunt and shrugging figure. His final gift to the world was Black Star, a brutally honest farewell, though not one that Bowie feels inclined to explain. There were no interviews or cliff notes to define Black Star, only the disparate and powerful elements beautifully constructed for one's appreciation of a lifetime of who Bowie was. Someone never content to give you the answer, 
but one that asks you to take the journey with him. At the end of his journey, he gave us Black Star. Not a self-indulgent album, not a generic return to his past hits, simply a desire to express his experience of some universal truths in the way he knew best. That's really cool, man. Who wrote that? Did you write that, Scotty? Yeah, I wrote that. Oh, wow, wow. wow. <laughs> Fucking A, I thought you were quoting somebody, Scotty. <laughs> Standing O, if I could stand. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was, that was eloquent as shit, Scotty. That was beautiful. Holy shit, Scotty's got a poet inside of him. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, she just thought I actually, yeah, they, I, they took him that. That's something I actually wrote about it. I mean, I really, to be honest with you, listen to this album, and I really, when I was when we were, I was researching Bowie, I was really trying to get into the mindset of what David Billy was as a person, and he was really just someone that, was like someone who was highly intelligent. He was never satisfied, and he always strived to share what he felt with you, but in a way that was personal to you. He never like he never tried to explain and shove things down your throat. It was so, he was someone who really truly wanted you to have your own experience with his music, and that's why I felt like he never explained a lot of it. And Black Star was just a beautiful fucking gift. And I think that when I heard the album the first time, it was I actually I listened to it right when it came out because I'm a big David Bowie fan, and I was just like, I was kind of perplexed, to be honest with you. I was kind of like, this is a really, I mean, it's a short album. It was strange. I didn't know anything about Bowie being ill. Right, nobody did. I mean, no one really did, except the ver- people very, very close to him. And the way it ended, and the way it was just so prophetic, and the way it just, I, I mean, I don't think there's many albums that have ever really touched me as a person like Black Star has because it was really just someone pouring their heart and soul into something like him being so ill, him dying, him having cancer, him dealing with all these emotions of his own death, his own mortality. Right. And how many people, when they reach that point in their life, just kind of disappear? You know uh, most mean? of them. Most people. Most people just end up on a bed somewhere. And, and maybe at the end of his life, he did too. But he did this first. And, uh, you know, that's that's a huge thing. That's great. I, I would have been out of touch with Bowie. Uh, I'm not a huge fan until Black Star. And after his death, I listened to it, obviously. And man, dude, just a fucking solid album. Just totally great. Like you said, very short, sweet, to the point. Um, but totally different than anything I've, I've ever heard from Bowie. And really kind of given context by his death, too. Like, yes, once you knew extremely. what he was struggling with while he was writing it and performing it and recording it, um, you really start I mean, to de- understand de- dealing it. Dealing with incurable cancer, I mean, like you said, most people, they just fade away. And, and, I mean, Black Star is a very appropriate name because he went out with a fucking, the, just a blinding flash of light that I just really can't think of many artists that have done the same, or any. Absolutely. Blinding flash of black great album um so uh that's basically that, that's basically what i prepared for the show this pretty much uh, draws our music block to very near its close you know somebody asked earlier what's that Paul? if we picked each of us picked a musician and and, and that's how we did this and that's yeah. exactly what happened that's, that's exactly, exactly happened. yeah we when we were doing the planning for these three episodes that we've just done uh the um you know, I wanted to do a Manson episode. I thought it'd be cool if each of us did a different musical figure. So I picked Manson. Paul picked Kurt Cobain. Scotty picked David Bowie. And uh, we have one more little video in this music block coming up. Can't tell you anything more about it. I will tell you that it's going to round up the music block. And if you want to see what it is, now's the time to become a patron either I'm- at the... Five or the ten dollar level, and we can tell them too that it's different than this. It's not going to be, not be a another... retrospective on a, a single band or or musical personality. No, this is going to be something yeah. that's a little bit more all. You know how you can find out? There, there's one way to find out. There is. There's only one way to find out. Only one way. Well, I guess there's Become more ways, but those involve Become piracy. A patron. <laughs> Become a Become patron. Become a fucking patron. Pieces of shit. Feast Give these ill prepared, the ill tempered, fat losers your money. Yes. Yes. Do it now! Feast upon the freshness. Thank what, you to uh, our uh, viewers. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and listened and uh, had a good time with us here today. I'll we'll see you Wednesday. We'll see, yeah, we're going to see him Wednesday. See you Wednesday. And so for won't be you, too long. Uh, and, uh, you know, for you uh, $10 people, uh, just know that because... We introduced that perk at the beginning of the month. That perk doesn't start till next month. I don't want there to be any confusion like, where's our live thing? 
Maybe we'll do it for you a little bit later this month, but it technically there, isn't starting until is next month. There is a big thing coming up on Wednesday that you guys are going to see as well. But uh, we will start giving you $10 people a few little things here and there as we get the structure of the perks some, set up. Some more juicy content. Juicy, delicious content. Yes. Please stay tuned. All right. So thank you, guys. We appreciate you. And uh, we will see you next time. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good.